Hello folks, welcome back. Pastor Bob from Place of Refuge. Today the title I have is The Calming of the Winds of Life. Now I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now this talks a lot about Israel, and there's parallels with us. And it talked about how they wandered in the, in the desert there, or the wilderness I should say, for 40 years. And there's alluding back to the belief and unbelief. So just stick with me because we're going to be jumping from Hebrews to some of our you know, current situations, if you will. So let me read there and we'll get started. God bless. All right, this is verse one here and it starts and it says, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse two, for unto us the gospel was preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall they if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in certain place of seven days on his wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his work. And in this place again, if they enter shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. There you go, the unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time as it said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them the rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. Verse 9, And there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own work, as God did from his. In verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. All right, so there's a parallel between us and what the Israelites, they did because of unbelief. Well, it says here, fear, let us therefore fear. All right, now, God doesn't want us to, he's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But right now, the word fear here, it does, it means, it's more in the context in this, it means a, a deference and a respect, reverential and a regard. Why? Lest, lest a promise left us. Now, that promise here is a promise of God. Left us means it depart from us and leave behind. And leave in the lurch. It actually said that in uh, the Greek, or forsake, of entering into his rest. Now, this is a resting place, ceasing from labor. Or a place of rest, calamity of the, it says, cal, excuse me, not calamity, it's calming of the winds. This is where my text comes, the calming of the winds of life. It's, it means um, calming of the winds, the resting which God promised or promises. Amen. How many know in the Bible all his promises are yes and amen? That's what it says. All right. Any of you should seem to come short of it, if any of you should come short or behind, have failed to obtain or divine favor. Think about that. Fall short through recognition of God to be left behind in the race so to fail to reach the goal. Well, we all want to reach that goal. Amen. To fall short of the end, be inferior and lack, to be in want or lack and suffer want. All right. That's a mouthful, I know, but I want to lay the groundwork. Verse 2, for unto us the gospels preached as well unto them. All right. But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard of it. Now, the word prophet, obviously, but it means to assist, to be useful or advantageous, to further or help, not being mixed, now that, or co-mingle, to unite, temper together, so that one part counterbalances the other, not being mixed with what? Faith. How many know faith is the issue? It always is the issue. What is that? The conviction of truth, your and I fidelity, faithfulness, and the character of one who can be relied on. So I've, I ask my church, I'm asking you the same thing. Can you be relied on? I hope so. Amen. God could, should be able to entrust us with things. And I trust he can. Amen. To them that hear it, to hear something. Now, when, when, it, when you see that word hear in the Bible, even in Hebrew and uh, the Greek, it means to consider what has been said. I want you to consider what we've read so far. Consider what we're going to read in these 
verse 11, all from 1 to 11. We need to consider what has been said to give ear to a teaching or a teacher. And that's just obviously these certain group did not listen. You and I, hopefully, will listen. Amen? Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, or into rest, as he said, and I have sworn in my wrath if they enter into my rest, and although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And that's kind of deep here, but the word believe, for we which have believed do enter into rest. What is that? Now the word, again, we're talking, it's this very believed, is um, very close to faith, which is kind of co-mingle with each other, place our confidence and to trust Jesus as God is able to aid either in obtaining or doing something, to entrust a thing to one. Amen? So, it's been my observation, and this is, you know, just an observation. Those who have fear, anxiety, and stress, possibly, maybe even doubt, are really not resting in the Lord. Check your heart. You know, and I'm not talking about like when sudden calamity or adversity comes, everybody deals with fear and stuff like that. It's like, whoa, what that, you know, remember a couple uh, messages ago, I talked about the security for the believer and insecurity for the wicked. I mean, we do get apprehensive sometimes, but sometimes, but it should not be a habitual thing of having, living in fear, anxiety, and stress. How many would agree with that? We'll have times like that, but then we pray and trust the Lord, read scripture, and maybe even have to repent. But nevertheless, we should not live there. All right, now let me go on. We're in verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his work. All right, I'm going to tell you where that's at. It's in Genesis 2 2. And it reads this And on the seventh day, God entered his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Now that rested here means he ceased and desist. It means desist from labor to cause to cease. Pretty obvious. Amen. Now I want to give you a side scripture here. And this is this is a, a real bold one, but it's awesome. Daniel 9:27. So we're going to go back to the Old Testament. And here's what it reads. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate even the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate now that is that's a huge thing so daniel uses this verb cease here in 927 to indicate a ceasing of what here's what it means of the ritual sacrifice and offerings so in this passage daniel is speaking of the messiah coming amen and the establishment of the new covenant praise the lord and when there would be no more need for ritual sacrifices. So guess what? The word cease here is the same Hebrew word where God rested on the seventh day. So we got he rested and then here and cease. So what's my point? God didn't, he didn't rest because he was exhausted. He didn't. Because if that was the case, then he wouldn't be all wonderful, all omnipotent, amen, omnipresent, and so on. He rested because it was complete. We don't sacrifice animals anymore. Why? Because Christ come on, died on the cross. He fulfilled the law, so you and I accept him as our Lord and Savior on faith. We don't have to do a ritual. All Old Testament was to come and tell about Jesus coming in the new. So that was complete. May I submit to you? When you and I rest from fear, anxiety, and stress, we are complete and at peace who? In the Lord. We need to enter his rest. Amen? We got to say an amen to that. Now let me read verses. We're going back to Hebrews now. Verses 5 and 6. And, uh, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not. Why? Because of unbelief. How many would agree with this? There's times that you and I can have unbelief. Oh my goodness, you know, we get overwhelmed with fear, anxiety, and stress. And, and <laughs> we just lose it and we blow it. Israel did not enter to Canaan. Why? Because of unbelief. Amen? Now it's believed. Now I'm going to go into this uh, in a minute. We'll talk about Psalm 95 verses 8 to 
through 11. All right. Here it says in verse um, 8, I think I jumped beyond one, but at any rate, here, let me go back one second. And it says in verse 7, again, I want to touch base again. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long, as it said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Now, that's important, guys. Amen? For if Jesus had given them rest, okay, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now, the word Jesus here, my friends, is Joshua. All right? It was, it's kind of synonymous. Yeus, all right, means Jesus. All right? But it says... Here I jump in. So don't harden your heart. I said that was in verse 7. Actually, it's in verse 7. I said verse 8, probably. Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Now that means make hard, make stiff, make stubborn, obtaining to show stubbornness. Provocation is strife and contention, a condition of hostility. All right? Temptation. That's a testing and a proving and trial in the wilderness. And then it says this. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. How many know that's true? There is. So, and it says, and we go back. Now, you know what? I am in 95 here. Let me go back. I want to get this for you. I jumped you again. Sorry. I want to make sure that we read this in Psalm 95. Because what I did is I wrote this down, but I didn't uh, highlight it. And so I went to the wrong spot. All right. So I want to, I want to read this because it's so important. All right. Here we go. This is Psalm 95. I, I made reference to it later. I apologize. All right. I'm going to go back. Now we're in Psalm 95. I apologize. Verses 8 through 11. Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swore in my wrath they should not enter in, into my rest. That's that's where we're at now, and I apologize, and I broke that down. Harden means make hard, make stiff, make stubborn. Don't be obstinate. Show stubbornness. Provocation, again, to reiterate again, excuse me. Strife and contention, a condition of what? Hostility. Temptation, testing, proving, trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long, I was grieved with this generation. You guys know the story. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Now think about that. They have not known my ways. My goodness. They, <laughs> they delivered them through all Egypt, the Red Sea, all this stuff, you know. They, and they lost it because they of unbelief. So Joshua and Caleb, Caleb are the only ones that made it. You know that. So And they rebelled. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. How many times do you and I wander in the wilderness because we don't trust God? Amen? We do. And then when that happens, like verse 11 here, for unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not end for my rest or resting place or quietness. If you and I have fear, anxiety, and stress, may I submit to you, we're not resting in the Lord. And I get it. We all go through it. So it's used in several ways to denote places where there's you know, his rest is peaceful and quiet and trust, and the trust are present. All right. Now, we'll go back to Hebrews 4. I am sorry. I jumped one. So now we're in verse 7. <laughs> Let me go back. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, Daniel, or David, excuse me, today after so long a time, as it said, today, if you will uh, hear my voice, harden not your heart. Amen. And it's, no, pardon me, that was back in, in 95. So, don't harden our hearts. My goodness, I keep jumping, I apologize. So, that Jesus, again, is Yeshua, okay? And it means Jesus and Joshua, all right? Now, I got to get back to where I was. Verse, um, let's see. Verse, we're going to go back to Hebrews 4. I apologize. Oh, yeah, this is fun. Now, I'm back in Hebrews chapter 4. Apologize. Verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own work, as God did from his. Now we kind of touch. Okay. The word enter means to go out and come in. As an entrance, you're going out and coming into what? Enter his rest. Has what? Ceased from his own work. You and I, 
No longer. We don't depend on the Mosaic law. You and I don't depend on anything else but Jesus Christ. Let us labor, therefore, to enter in that rest, lest any man shall fall short after the same example of unbelief. Okay, that labor means to make haste and to exert yourself to endeavor to give diligence. Amen? The worst enemy of you and I is what? Unbelief. You and I have unbelief. Amen? You know, it's so funny. I preach this with my church, and I had the same trouble. I got attacked where there's just so much, you know, the, the devil does not want to hear this. So I apologize. We're jumping here a little bit. But now we're back. The word unbelief here in verse 11 is very strong, and it means obstinate. Opposition to divine will, his divine will, disobedience, unwillingness to be persuaded, and disbelief. We need to believe what it says. Amen. Now, my question is this, and I ask my people the same thing as you're watching this. Can you and I enter into his rest in our present life today? How many would agree with you? Can you? Yes or no? I believe you can. Now, let me, Matthew, we're going to do some side scripture here. And I told you I was going to get back to uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, the labor here means to grow weary. Okay? It means you're tired, you're exhausted. How many is tired and exhausted? I know some of you because I know it's from personal. It's hard sometimes. It means to be toiled or with burdens or grief and worn out. You're just tired. Amen? To toil. And I will give you rest. Now, this is a little different, but it means to give rest and refresh, to give oneself rest, take rest. To, now, how about this one? To keep quiet. Sometimes you need it. But that calming of the spirit is of calm and patient expectation. That's what it means to be quiet. It's a calm and patient expectation. And then it uses a word to recreate and refresh is used here. Oh, isn't that awesome? That is so good. You are heavy laden, okay, jump the verse, to place a burden upon a load, to load with a burden of rights and unwarranted. I have my arrows where it goes back and forth, and I, did, I jumped it again. Jeez, I'm on a roll here today. Heavy laden means to place a burden upon, to load, load one with a burden of rights and unwarranted. Now get this, unwarranted precepts, amen. But we've got, uh, it says here, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your soul. Whoa. Now a yoke, most of you probably know that, but maybe some of you don't. A yoke is put on the draught cattle. Remember those big loops? They were made out of wood. And you pull. You know, that's why they tell you not to be unequally yoked, because one is pulling more or pushing and whatever. And there's no unity there. So, you, you know, we need to be equally yoked with our people, our wives, our husbands. Amen. But the yoke here... It, the Pharisees back then, they put on a whole bunch of unnecessary, you know, do's and don'ts, you know, commands that they didn't even um, do themselves. And it's, and learn of me, it says. You know, I will say this to you. The more I learn about the Word of God, the more I can have peace in my life. And if I'm not in God's Word, I don't have peace. I really don't. Because, you know, you can drift a little way, but boy, the Lord, his love letter to you, it teaches you and tells you exactly what to do. Learn of me. Increase one's knowledge. To be in, increased in knowledge. To learn by use. Hallelujah. In practice. Use and practice. Read the word and use it. And practice it. Amen. One brother made the comment about this verse. Now, how many know what a paradox is? All right. He said, here's what he said. Strange paradox that a man already weary and overloaded must take a new weight upon him in order to be eased in fine rest. I thought that was pretty interesting. So here's what a paradox means. It's a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. Well, may I submit to you? This is true. Take my yoke upon you. Now, the problem is they put unnecessary yoke, but Jesus Christ does not. You just do what he says, and it's very easy. It really is. You know, you can have peace in your life. So that's what it says. And so may I submit there's no, per, you know, God's word is there's no perhaps true. That's what it said in the Merriam Dictionary. 
is perhaps true. May I submit to you, God's word is always true. Always, always, always. Amen. So he gave the scripture, which really does clarify it in Psalm 55, 22. Now get this one. Cast thy burden who? Upon the Lord. And he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be what? Moved. To be shaken, to be overthrown. That's what, or let fall. You know, that's a side scripture. Psalm 55, 22. All right. And it says, learn of me. But we'll go back to Matthew eleven twenty. 20. Learn of me, for I am what? Meek and gentle and mild. You know, Jesus Christ is meek. You know, the word lowly in heart. Now, I want you to get this. It means he's humble. And may I submit, Jesus is kind. Now, this is my side word, myself. Jesus is kind, loving. And understanding. He's always, always willing to help. Amen. He always did. He died for us. He did it all. He's always willing to help. Now listen, the devil jacks with you so many times. He'll tell you, well, you blew it. You've heard this in some of my past messages. Oh, you might as well go on. You blew it. You're dead. No, that's exactly what the devil wants to do. You're never going to find rest. You're only going to find rest in Jesus Christ. So he's, he's meek and lowly in heart. He's very humble. Amen. Go on. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, the word here, it said recreation. Now, think about that recreation. It means inward tranquility. While one performs necessary labor, then guess what the word recreation means? Refreshment of strength and spirit after work. He's just going to restrain. And you find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The easy means it's fit for use, good for any use, virtuous, good, profitable, easy to use, have nothing or harsh getting galling about it. It said galling, nothing harsh or galling about it, not vexing, not irritating. All right, come on to me and I will what? Give you rest. Hang on to that, my friend. Now, I mentioned this earlier about 2 Timothy 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, may I submit to you, that is true. All right, I'm going to break this down. He's given us what? He has not given us a spirit of fear. In other words, he's not going to bestow on that. He's not going to give somebody to, you know, for care for his interests with fear. No, he's not going to give it to you. He will not give it to his own, a spirit of fear. Okay, given. The spirit of fear is timidity, timidity fearfulness, and cowardness. You know, we have fear, we can be cowards. But we need to be bold as lions. Amen. We've got to have wisdom behind it. We can't be doing anything silly. But, you know, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. All right. Power it means a spirit of fear, but a power, strength, power, ability, achieving power, being able and capable. You can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's given us a, not a spirit of fear, but a power and love. Guess what that is? Agape. And that means affection, goodwill, benevolence, brotherly love. And it even says, if you go to the strong, love feeds. He's given you agape or love. And now here it is. He's given you a sound mind. That means soundness of mind, moderation. Here it is. Self-control, sobriety, and sound judgment. That's exactly what it means in the Greek. Go and look it up. It'll tell you what it says. It's awesome. All right, now, I want to go to another side scripture. This is 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, verse 7, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. Amen? Casting all your care upon him, that care is, in some of your new translation, in his proper I use the King James a lot because um, I can break, I can go to the original Hebrew, and in this case, the, the original Greek. So if it says this in your Bible, it's a correct translation, casting all your anxiety on him. Remember I talked about having anxiety, stress, amen, and fear. Casting all your anxiety, for he cares for you. Another side scripture, I love this one, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. He's here. What do you think it is in the Old Testament? Shalom. Hallelujah. Means completeness, soundness, tranquility, and contentment. Praise God. Whose mind 
is stayed or rest or lean against or brace oneself whose mind is stayed on who? Him. Amen? Folks, I apologize for jumping some of those scriptures, but I didn't want to start over again because the way I had it written down, I jumped it here. And, now I, and so I, am, I apologize for that. But it just, you know, the devil loves to mix these things up, and I apologize he did it again, but I still want to keep going forward with this. I don't care. I'm not prideful to where I look foolish, and that's okay. I just want you to get the message. Amen? Now, I have what I was doing is towards the end of this message when I had this, I, um, the Lord downloaded a prayer to me. I normally don't do this, but I did it this time, and I'd like to share it with you. What I'm going to ask you to do is to humbly just repeat after me on if you had fear, anxiety, and stress. Amen? If you will do this, Lord, no, I would, toward the end of the message, the Lord gave me this, and so I wrote it down. So here's what I want you to do is to humbly pray this with me. Amen? All right. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds in between so you can go with me. All right? Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me for succumbing to fear, anxiety, and stress. I now send these back to hell where they come from because you did not give them to me. I now accept your peace, your love, the real sound mind you gave me, and I now enter your rest in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that's going to make you feel better, not because I come up with it, the Holy Spirit gave me that. It's because you're surrendering your life to him. Remember, they wandered for 40 years because of unbelief. Let us not wander. So I hope this ministered to you. I know it was jumpy a little bit, and I apologize for that. But nevertheless, it's not about me. It's about the Word. Amen? So, Father, I pray that you bless these folks. I thank you for them taking the time to listen to it. I hope it makes sense. So God bless them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you, folks. I'll catch you next week.